Hi everyone, it's James Walters here from Cardiff University. I'm chairing today's session just to say we'll give people a couple of minutes to join us before I introduce uh, Professor Marcus Manafo. Um, so be with you in a couple of minutes. Okay, I think we should probably get going and then people can join us as we go through. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the PGC lab meetings, I'm James Walters um, from Cardiff University. It's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome Professor Marcus Manafo um, to speak to us for around the next hour. Marcus is just over the bridge in Bristol um, in England and is Professor leading, Professor of Biological Psychiatry leading the tobacco alcohol research group, although as he's just told me, it's expanded beyond that remit, but TARG is quite a catchy name, so they're, <laughs> they're maintaining that. Uh, Marcus has been a leader in the field for, for some years now of genetic epidemiology and particular method, methodological approaches and critique um, of, of other approaches, and I really look forward to hearing from him. Um, I first met when Marcus, I don't know if he remembers, but he taught me psychology as a psychiatry undergraduate. Um, and it was still some of the best teaching that I've had. Um, so there we go. I look forward to it. Marcus, over to you. And, and thanks again for agreeing to talk to us this afternoon. Just it's to say, um, we're, we're going to take questions at the end of the session, but feel free um, to ask questions during the session as they, as they come to you. Thanks very much, Marcus. Brilliant. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the uh, for the kind words as well. So it's uh, it's great to be able to um, to talk today. Thanks for uh, dialing in, so to speak. And um, I should say from the outset that the topic of this talk is really trying to understand causal pathways between cannabis, tobacco, and mental health. And I'm part of the MRC Integrative Epidemiology in un uh, Unit in Bristol, which is led by George Davy Smith. And as many of you will know, that unit has a particular interest in causal inference in the context of observational data. And in particular, using genetic information through Mendelian randomization approaches uh, to leverage stronger causal inference in that context. And as ever larger GWAS have generated ever larger number of um, variants associated with exposures and outcomes of interest, we've been able to uh, apply this method more widely and obtain more precise and more robust uh, results as the years have gone on. So we're now at the point where we can begin to be confident about some of those results. And so I'll talk about uh, some published and some preliminary findings uh, in that context today, looking specifically at this question of substance use and mental health with a focus on cannabis and tobacco. So the basic context to this is that we know that there are very strong observational associations between substance use and mental health. And uh, the question is really to what extent that reflects a causal pathway as opposed to confounding. And if it is a causal pathway, what the direction of causality is, whether um, for example, among smokers, the perception that smoking helps to cope with stress is in fact because nicotine has a short half-life. Smokers go into withdrawal an hour or two after smoking their last cigarette if they're heavy smokers. That can lead to them feeling anxious, irritable, and then they smoke a cigarette and they resolve their withdrawal symptoms Then they lo no longer feel anxious and irritable. And so it feels to them interoceptively that smoking has helped them cope with their um, symptoms. But in fact, those symptoms were only there in the first place because they were a smoker. So is it misattribution? Is it self-medication that um, smoking cannabis use might help to resolve some symptoms either in those with a diagnosis of um, uh, a mental illness or in those with uh, high levels of symptoms who are otherwise healthy? Or are these substances causal risk factors for these uh, um, outcomes. And so in the context of cannabis, for example, there is uh, reasonably strong evidence that cannabis is the causal risk factor for schizophrenia. So 
understanding that is complex and it's made more complex by the fact that um, in epidemiology we have a, a slightly checkered track record if you like in terms of being able to uh, identify robust associations that do in fact reflect a causal pathway and so there's this nice cartoon at the top right um, which illustrates just how confusing epidemiological evidence can be to the general public because when it's uh, translated into news stories the focus tends to be on the results as definitive when in fact they're typically not and even if there is clear evidence of an association that can be replicated across different um, studies in different contexts very robustly that doesn't still tell us whether or not that association is causal so this is all reasonably well established and uh, widely known stuff but it does uh, feed into this general confusion that we often experience in the general public with respect to the findings that we we report so the problem is this that um, we know that people who use cannabis are different from people who don't use cannabis and the same is true for smokers and so this issue of confounding is problematic and there's also this potential for uh, um, bi-directional causality that cannabis use may be a risk factor for uh, mental health outcomes but those mental health outcomes might also influence the likelihood of people using cannabis or being at risk of mental health uh, poor mental health outcomes might be uh, something that increases the risk of cannabis use so how can we unpick this well of course the conventional approach is to use statistical adjustment for those different confounders. We measure all of the things that we think could be potential confounders in that relationship that we see between cannabis use and schizophrenia, say, or, or tobacco use and some other outcome. And then we adjust for all of those things. The problem is that we can never do that perfectly. So here are some data not reported by ourselves, but reviewed in this um, paper that's referenced here, which talks about different causal inference methods, looking at Behavioural difficulties in the offspring of mothers according to whether or not the mothers drank alcohol during pregnancy. And you can see here a um, J-shaped relationship and, and epidemiology is rich with J-shaped associations, some of which um, pander to our, our um, hopes and dreams, if you like, that in this case, um, drinking a little bit of alcohol might actually be uh, better for our offspring because observationally, mothers who consumed small quantities of alcohol during pregnancy have children with the lowest um, behavioral problems in uh, childhood and adolescence. So you can see that there's a roughly linear relationship between um, alcohol consumption and behavioral difficulties with heavier alcohol consumption associated with uh, more behavioral difficulties, the heavier the mother drinks during pregnancy, but actually the, some of the worst outcomes are amongst the mothers who don't drink at all during pregnancy suggesting that there may be some protective effect. Now that's not necessarily very biologically plausible, but this is what the epidemiological data would tell us. But actually, if we look at all of the different confounding factors, and these, are, um, these results are robust to adjustment for confounding, so we still see that apparent protective effect of alcohol consumption in pregnancy on behavioral outcomes in the offspring, uh, when we adjust for all the usual things like socioeconomic position and smoking behavior and things like that. The problem is that when we look at those confounders, so for example, here we're looking at uh, the percentage of mothers who never worked or were in long term uh, or were long term unemployed, we see exactly the same pattern with um, the lowest rates of, um, in this case, that confounder being amongst the mothers who drank uh, a smaller quantity of alcohol during pregnancy, with higher rates amongst those who didn't drink at all during pregnancy. And we also see the same thing for the percentage of mothers who smoked during pregnancy, with the never drinkers smoking more than the light drinkers. And the issue here is that um, these confounders are measured, but they're not measured perfectly. So there's a degree of imprecision in our measurement of those confounders. They all follow the same basic shape that we see for the association between the exposure and the outcome of interest here, drinking in pregnancy and offspring uh, behavioral difficulties, but they don't quite follow it perfectly. So in other words, because we know that we can't measure all potential confounders because there may be confounders that we haven't anticipated, but more importantly, perhaps, even when we do measure confounders, we can't measure them perfectly. Statistical adjustment is never going to perfectly resolve the impact of confounding in these associations. And so we're going to be left with associations that are robust to statistical adjustment, but may still be spurious in terms of whether or not they reflect a causal pathway. So we need better methods to uh, 
leverage stronger causal inference, going beyond statistical adjustment and using the design of the study itself, if you like, to provide that, um, that basis for inference. So to give an example of that, we can use uh, negative controls. So there is um, very clear evidence that smoking is strongly associated with uh, risk of suicide. And of course, the question is whether that's a causal association or not. And in this commentary uh, from a few years ago, George Daly Smith, the director of our unit in Bristol, um, said that we need to be careful about that interpretation because if we look at a negative control outcome, in other words, an outcome for which there's no plausible biological link between the exposure, but which shares perhaps similar confounding structures to the outcome of interest, say suicide, we see a similar association. So when we look at murder, homicide as an outcome, a negative control outcome for which there's no plausible biological pathway from smoking, we see a similar strength of association, an increased risk of being murdered the more heavily you smoke, as we see for risk of suicide, suggesting that that association that we see for suicide may not in fact be causal because it, we, see, we see it for murder and the likelihood is that um, that's due to confounding. And there's this great quote in that paper, unless the provisional wing of the health education lobby has moved on to a direct action phase during which they shoot smokers, this association is very unlikely to be causal. So the point here again is that we have an association between smoking and suicide that is uh, very clear, highly replicable, very robust to statistical adjustment. And yet we also see a similar association with murder where there is a much less um, clear biological pathway that we could um, appeal to, if you like, in terms of interpreting that association as causal. And it's only through the use of these negative controls that we can see the ease with which we could potentially be misled by that, um, that first association that we looked at. So the kinds of techniques that um, we use to support stronger causal inference are the use of positive and negative controls, where either for the exposures or the outcomes, uh, we look at uh, comparisons where the confounding structures are likely to be different, but there's no plausible biological connection. So for example, if we're interested in tobacco or alcohol use in pregnancy, we could look at uh, paternal tobacco or alcohol use as a negative control exposure, where there's again, no plausible biological pathway that would lead to a, a similar magnitude of effect if the intrauterine exposure was um, causal. We can look at cross-contextual comparisons, looking at different populations with different confounding structures. So this has been used to look at the effects of breastfeeding, for example, on offspring IQ. In the UK and other high income countries, breastfeeding is associated with higher socioeconomic position. In low and middle income countries, breastfeeding is associated with lower socioeconomic position. And yet when we look at the association between breastfeeding and IQ, we see a similar association in those different populations, despite those differing confounding structures providing more support for the interpretation that that association is causal. But the approach that I want to focus on today is instrumental variable analysis, Mendelian randomization, which many of you will be familiar with, which is this idea that we can use genetic variants associated with an exposure of interest as potentially unconfounded proxies for that exposure. An instrumental variable analysis has a long tradition in the economics literature, but it's only relatively recently that um, although the idea is quite old, it's only relatively recently that we've had the data available to allow us to use that approach in the context of um, genetic variants that can be used as proxies. So the basic principles, and again, many of you will be familiar with this, but it's worth um, recapitulating the, the basics, if you like. Uh, we use the genetic variant or variants as an, as an instrument based on the assumption that an approximation of Mendel's first and second laws will mean that alleles are inherited independently of confounders. And of course, our germline DNA sequence uh, can't be affected by environmental factors. Uh, so these instruments can't be affected by reverse causality, which is perhaps particularly important in the context of what I'll be talking about today. So the idea is that by using those genetic variants as a proxy for the exposure, we can understand more about the causal effect of that exposure on the outcome. And one of the points to emphasize is that of course, although we're using genetics as a tool. This really isn't about genetics per se. It's about uh, understanding the causal effect of different modifiable exposures like smoking. So the idea is that there shouldn't, in principle, be no confounding, and to an extent we can, we can test for that. Um, there is, of course, the potential issue of pleiotropy, and uh, we might want to discuss that at the end, but it's important to distinguish between 
um, biological uh, pleiotropy and mediated pleiotropy, where the former is a threat to MR, but the latter isn't. It just suggests that there are different uh, steps along that causal pathway from the exposure to the outcome, which of course is um, likely to be the case for most exposure outcome relationships. My slides have stopped moving. Ah. Bear with me, my slides have just crashed unhelpfully. There we go. And as I mentioned, the outcome should not affect the, um, uh, the instrument in the context of an instrumental variable analysis. And because our germline DNA sequence can't be affected by outcomes, that uh, assumption should hold. So essentially what we're saying is that uh, this is not a perfect metaphor, but um, to some extent we can draw an analogy with a randomized controlled trial. In a trial, of course, we randomize people to an exposure or an intervention. The randomization method is the instrument, essentially. Um, whereas in Mendelian randomization, we're using the uh, underpinning assumptions to um, assume that we can therefore overlay a randomization structure onto our popular uh, observational data and thereby uh, leverage stronger causal inference. And of course, the question is, does it work? There are many um, plausible theoretical limitations to this approach, uh, including not least this issue of pleiotropy. But in practice, it tends to work. It tends to give us the answer that we would expect where, when we know what that answer is. And actually, we can see that um, in GWAS of uh, various disease outcomes that aren't formal Mendelian randomization analyses, but seen through that lens can be interpreted as such. So for example, for all of these different GWAS of uh, disease outcomes, lung cancer, COPD, emphysema, peripheral arterial disease, we see a very strong signal on chromosome 15. And that signal on chromosome 15 is not directly associated with those um, disease outcomes. There was some discussion about this, particularly in the context of lung cancer. But what it appears to be driving principally is heaviness of smoking among smokers. And of course, one common feature of those three different disease uh, phenotypes here is that they're all caused by smoking. So when we see a GWAS signal on chromosome 15 in particular, what we're seeing is a causal effect of smoking on that disease outcome. And therefore, the, G the GWAS is picking up a modifiable environmental cause of disease and not just the underpinning direct biology, if you like. And I think that's an important insight that when we interpret the results of GWAS, we shouldn't just be thinking about interpreting them in terms of what they tell us about biology. We should also be interpreting them in terms of what they tell us about these modifiable risk factors, because although that might um, in some cases be relatively mundane, we know that smoking causes lung cancer, for example, there may be other novel insights that these kinds of um, studies generate that can be more directly applied clinically if they are telling us about other effects of smoking, drinking, caffeine consumption uh, that weren't uh, well established previously. So that GWAS can be a tool for identifying these uh, immediately actionable, modifiable risk factors. So let's move on to some of the results that um, uh, hopefully will be interesting and generate some discussion. So this is a recent um, GWAS of cannabis use that's available on I uh, BioArchive. This is uh, cannabis use initiation. There was an earlier one. Um, this one has generated a few more hits. Um, and this is uh, led by um, Dutch colleagues, Karen Verbey in particular, that we've been working with. And this provides us with a number of SNPs that we can use in a Mendelian randomization analysis to look at the effects of cannabis use initiation on a range of outcomes. So of course, one obvious candidate to look at in this context is schizophrenia. There's a very um, mature literature on the observational association between cannabis use and schizophrenia. There is um, some evidence that it is a causal risk factor from conventional observational epidemiological studies, and in particular, longitudinal studies. It's plausible because there are acute psychotomimetic effects of cannabis administration, so that if we give people cannabis, they experience symptoms that are psychotic-like. Um, but I've always thought that's an interesting basis for supporting a causal interpretation in that the acute effects of a drug are not necessarily the same as the chronic effects of a drug, for example. Um, so I personally think we should be cautious about reading too much into those 
acute psychopharmacology studies in terms of the um, chronic effects in an epidemiological sense. But when we apply these SNPs that are associated with cannabis use initiation in a Mendelian randomization framework, we actually see very little evidence for a causal pathway from cannabis to schizophrenia risk. Uh, here we're looking at a variety of different uh, Mendelian randomization methods, inverse variance being the most powerful, but also the one that rests on the strongest assumptions regarding pleiotropy. And then the others, MR EGA, weighted median, weighted mode, resting on different and critically orthogonal assumptions about um, the degree of pleiotropy that's operating. So that what we look to do is triangulate results across those different methods. And the more consistent they are, particularly in terms of the um, point estimate, but also in terms of the uh, statistical evidence, the more confident we can be that that uh, causal effect that we're seeing is not driven by pleiotropy. And across the different methods, there's really no evidence that uh, cannabis use initiation is a causal risk factor for schizophrenia. Of course, that doesn't preclude an effect of more chronic cannabis use or heavier cannabis use on schizophrenia risk. And one of the things this GWAS wasn't able to do was differentiate between use of different strains of cannabis, so uh, high THC versus low THC cannabis, for example. But interestingly, when we look at genetic variants associated with schizophrenia risk, we see uh, quite clear evidence for a causal pathway from schizophrenia risk to cannabis use initiation. So uh, clear evidence using the inverse variance method, uh, which is the most powerful, but also point estimates that are quite similar and consistent with that across the other methods. MR EGA is statistically the least powerful of the approaches, so often generates quite large p-values, um, but the weighted median and weighted mode effects show some statistical evidence and uh, point estimates that are also consistent with that. So what this seems to be suggesting is that in terms of initiation of cannabis use at least, there's no clear evidence that that is a causal risk factor for schizophrenia, but the people with a high risk of schizophrenia might be more likely to use cannabis, which might mean that some of that observational association between cannabis use and schizophrenia is in part at least driven by reverse causality, some kind of self-medication perhaps, um, not necessarily in those with the diagnosis of schizophrenia, but those who are at high risk and are experiencing some psychotic-like symptoms. Uh, and and there, is, there is some evidence for that epidemiologically as well. And we've also looked at whether or not cannabis is a gateway drug. There's a great deal of concern about the potential for cannabis to be a gateway drug, whereby the use of one drug increases the likelihood of progression to the use of other drugs. And these analyses here are currently unpublished. We're writing them up at the moment. They're relatively uh, weak in that the um, GWAS that we've used for the outcomes, cocaine use, heroin use, and tobacco use, with the exception of tobacco, are relatively small GWAS, and therefore these analyses are probably underpowered. You can see that from the wide confidence intervals for cocaine and heroin. There's perhaps some evidence in terms of the direction of the point estimates for a pathway from cannabis use to cocaine, but really not very um, clear statistical evidence for that. Um, and interestingly, not much evidence for uh, a pathway from cannabis use to either heroin or tobacco use. So the idea that cannabis is a gateway drug is not strongly supported by the Mendelian randomization evidence to date, with the caveat that for two of the um, illicit drug outcomes, the power of those analyses is probably very limited. But then there's also this question about tobacco use. And uh, what's interesting about this is that, again, there's a very strong observational association. Tobacco use nearly always predates the onset of a schizophrenia diagnosis. And critically, when the um, schizophrenia G was, was published a couple of years ago, the one with 108 independent loci identified, um, there was a signal on chromosome 15. And that was one of the more unheralded findings within that G was. And yet that's the signal that we see for lung cancer, the signal that we see for COPD, the signal that we see for peripheral arterial disease. In the context of those diseases, because we know that they're caused by smoking, the interpretation is straightforward and, um, and unambiguous. But in the context of schizophrenia, that interpretation, that that signal on chromosome 15 may reflect a causal effect of smoking on schizophrenia, um, in my opinion, wasn't um, paid enough attention as a possibility. I guess I would say that because I've written a couple of commentaries to that effect. But anyway, uh, the obvious thing is to try and do something about that and to look at that more closely. So when um, 
Susie Gage was a postdoc in my group. She's now a lecturer at the University of Liverpool. She ran a two sample MR looking again at the two directions of causality between schizophrenia risk and smoking initiation and between smoking initiation and schizophrenia risk and showed some evidence for a pathway from smoking initiation to schizophrenia risk and little evidence of a pathway from schizophrenia risk to smoking initiation. Now, uh, the, um, the top finding is um, more robust, I think, because that was using uh, the 108 variants identified in the schizophrenia G was. The smoking initiation to schizophrenia analysis was more limited because at that point, um, there was uh, only one, um, well, variants in, within only one gene region that had been identified as associated with uh, smoking initiation, and that gene was BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which of course is uh, likely to be highly pleiotropic and uh, potentially play a role in um, schizophrenia via other pathways. And there were insufficient variants to allow us to use the various pleiotropy robust methods like MR EGA and so on. So we need to treat these with a, a degree of caution. But one of the issues with um, focusing on initiation is that that's only one part of a substance use trajectory. So people will start using cannabis or not, but then those that do start using cannabis may or may not progress to heavy use. And those that do may or may not at some point stop using the drug. And the same is true for tobacco. People tend to follow trajectories and it's really lifetime exposure or at least exposure up until the point of diagnosis that is likely to be a risk factor rather than simply initiation or simply heaviness of use once you've started. So we've conducted a GWAS of essentially lifetime tobacco use and the results are shown here. And what's interesting is that um, whilst we do identify quite a few new signals, we also identify uh, the known signals, if you like. So we see that strong signal on chromosome 15, um, but we also see uh, the signal on chromosome 9 that's known to be um, associated with tobacco use initiation. If you were to place the GWAS of those two phenotypes done independently alongside each other, the signal on chromosome 15 would be much stronger than the signal on chromosome 9. But when you put them together into a measure of lifetime use, they're essentially weighted differently because in terms of lifetime use, whether or not you start smoking in the first place is at least as important as how heavily you smoke once you do. So it's giving us a different instrument essentially that captures not just initiation or just heaviness of use, but a combination of the two. And when we look at that in the context of schizophrenia, we get what I think are reasonably clear results. So at the top, we're looking at the pathway from smoking to schizophrenia, and we can see very strong evidence um, using the inverse variance method, but quite consistent point estimates um, across the different pleiotropy robust methods um, and some reasonably strong statistical evidence for at least one of those as well. Whereas when we look at the pathway from schizophrenia risk to smoking, and this bearing in mind this is lifetime use, not uh, just initiation, we see only very weak evidence um, using one of the methods. So this looks more like smoking is a causal risk factor for schizophrenia than the received wisdom, which is that schizophrenia risk increases likelihood of smoking, for example, to self-medicate symptoms or amongst those with a diagnosis to um, ameliorate some of the side effects of um, antipsychotic medication. And then when we look at um, the question of gateway effects, we see not particularly compelling evidence, but again, um, bearing in mind the, the weak statistical power of the uh, cocaine and heroin outcomes, some somewhat clearer evidence that if anything, tobacco use is the gateway drug, not cannabis use. So tobacco use seems to um, be associated with subsequent uh, cannabis use initiation. Um, again, the point estimates are reasonably consistent across the different methods, and there is some statistical evidence in the most powerful method, the inverse variance, and that's also true for cocaine, uh, less so for heroin, but again, the confidence intervals are wide, and the point estimates are all directionally consistent with the possibility that tobacco use initiation might be a gateway to other substance use. So this is particularly interesting in the context of uh, the current political climate around decriminalization or legalization of cannabis, which obviously we've seen uh, for many years in the Netherlands, but now we're seeing in various US states and most recently in Canada. And has, I think, important implications, if true, for where we should be focusing our public health 
efforts. And of course, I wouldn't say that these results are definitive. I think they're suggestive and point us in some interesting directions. But in terms of the mental health burden associated with substance use and the risk of progression from one substance to other arguably harder and more damaging substances, it looks like, if anything, tobacco use is a greater concern than cannabis use. And of course, we're only able to reach those, albeit um, measured and tempered conclusions, through the application of the insights that we've obtained through GWAS. And it's worth bearing in mind that no method is perfect. I alluded to the point that uh, we try to triangulate our results across different Mendelian randomization methods that rely on different assumptions. But Mendelian randomization itself is only one method that relies on um, particular assumptions. So it's worth looking at the extent to which the results that we see align with other studies that use other approaches and that rest on different assumptions. And I think in the context of smoking and schizophrenia, it's interesting that in the last couple of years, we've seen a couple of um, potentially quite important papers reaching broadly the same conclusion. So this is a paper from Robin Murray's group, which is a systematic review and meta-analysis of prospective observational studies, uh, which suggests that tobacco use does indeed predate uh, the onset of psychosis and is a risk factor for the subsequent onset of psychosis. And they conclude that daily tobacco use is associated with that increased risk, earlier age at onset uh, of psychotic illness, and therefore um, should be considered as a potential causal risk factor. And then there's this very nice epidemiological study that uses, again, a range of different methods, uh, including quite sophisticated conventional epidemiological techniques, taking into account a potential prodromal phase um, before the diagnosis of schizophrenia to exclude potential reverse causality, but also um, a family designed to take into account a degree of familial confounding, and again reaches the conclusion that um, these data are consistent with smoking being a causal risk factor for schizophrenia. And in terms of that genetic variant on chromosome 15, using perhaps a, a stronger Mendelian randomization design, but in a sample that doesn't have enough schizophrenia cases to allow that to be looked at with adequate power, using that single variant on chromosome 15 and looking to see whether or not there is an association with, in this case, antipsychotic medication, stratifying on smoking status. So there, the assumption would be that if that genetic variant is exerting its influence on the outcome via smoking, we would only see the association in current smokers, but we wouldn't see it, or ever smokers perhaps, but we wouldn't see it in never smokers. And that indeed is what they see for antipsychotic medication use. They don't have enough cases of schizophrenia to have adequate power to look at that, unfortunately, um, which is one of the limitations. And I'll finish with this point, which is that the received wisdom um, in the scientific community, the psychiatric community, has always been that tobacco use is uh, somehow a form of self-medication by patients with schizophrenia. And I'd point to these papers, which um, highlight the role that the tobacco industry has played in propagating that narrative by funding research into uh, the question of self-medication, for example, by directly marketing tobacco products to patients with schizophrenia in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, so there is an argument that that narrative has actually been constructed by the tobacco industry as a means of um, identifying a segment of the market that they can, um, that they can target particularly and also by getting a section of the medical community to be relatively sympathetic to tobacco use amongst their patients. So I'll conclude with the general point that observational epidemiology often gives us very precise estimates in very large sample sizes, but if all we rely on is statistical adjustment, then those precise estimates may be very precisely incorrect if what we're interested in is identifying cause and effect relationships. Triangulation using a range of different methods, either different causal inference methods like negative controls, cross-contextual comparisons, Mendelian randomization and so on, um, can support stronger causal inference because if those assumptions are different, then the likelihood of generating the same spurious finding through all of those different approaches will become vanishingly small. And as we generate ever larger GWAS of ever more valuable and interesting exposures and outcomes, the scope for applying Mendelian randomization methods and these various pleiotropy robust methods grows rapidly. And what I've hopefully illustrated is how those GWAS results can very directly tell us something that is of um, public health and policy 
relevance. So I'll just finish by thanking um, all of the fantastic postdocs and PhD students and research assistants and in my group uh, who do nearly all of the hard work. And I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Marcus, thank you very much indeed. That was really interesting and you managed to make what are at times for non-epidemiologist complex um, considerations relatively simple to understand, I think. So please ask questions. We've got one from Johnny Coleman at KCL who says, can we disentangle the physiological effects of smoking from the psychology of smoking? For example, could your results about the causal effects of smoking be accounted for by greater risk taking risky behavior by smokers rather than smoking per se? Well, I think that's a really important question. And the answer is um, using the methods that I've described, no, because it doesn't tell us anything about what it is about smoking that's having an effect. So it could be, for example, that it's just nicotine exposure. Um, and we could come up with a biologically plausible explanation for that. That would be very interesting to understand that from a public health perspective, given the rise in vaping and the use of nicotine containing products that aren't tobacco products. Um, but at the moment, we don't have the instruments, if you like, available to us to be able to disentangle those two. In the future, we will. We'll have in five or 10 years time, I would imagine, a GWAS of vaping that will tell us about nicotine consumption and we'll be able to look to see whether that generates uh, similar results to what we see for smoking. But this touches on that distinction between um, biological and mediated pleiotropy, sometimes um, described as vertical and horizontal pleiotropy. And um, mediated pleiotropy would mean that there's something about smoking that has an effect on something, and that in turn has an effect on, in this case, schizophrenia risk. It could be quite a proximal effect, like I say, nicotine exposure, or it could be quite a distal effect that smoking has an effect on risk-taking behavior, which in turn has an effect on um, schizophrenia risk, or it could have an effect on um, social interactions or any other number of intermediates between that exposure and that outcome. And at the moment, we don't have the tools available to, um, to disentangle that. In principle, though, we could. If we can generate uh, GWAS of those potential intermediates, then we can start to conduct uh, mediation analyses in the Mendelian randomization framework or multivariable analyses. So that um, I think that will be something that we will begin to be able to do over the next uh, few years. And in fact, we're beginning to do that by looking at, for example, the effects of education on smoking. Uh, there are clear protective effects of high educational attainment on smoking. People who have more years in education are less likely to smoke and the Mendelian randomization analyses um, would suggest that that's in fact causal. But is that an, an effect of general cognitive ability, which of course then has an effect on educational attainment, or is it something about educational attainment itself and being in school? And in a multivariable analysis where we used GWAS results for both cognitive ability and educational attainment simultaneously, we find that it's the educational attainment that has the protective effect on um, smoking, not general cognitive ability. So. We're, we're, we're at the point where we're beginning to be able to tease these things apart. Excellent, thanks. There's, there's another question, which is uh, from an anonymous attendee who says, given how small an influence on phenotype most of the variants have, why should they work as instrumental variables? Well, uh, they work because of the very large sample sizes that we have available to us. Um, so they are potentially quite weak, in, quite, quite weak instruments, but that's offset to some extent by very large sample size. And now that we have these very large um, summary consortia, which have generated summary statistics, um, or we have UK Biobank, for example, um, we, we're, we're able to conduct these analyses in a, in a tractable way. But you can see that um, many of the analyses that I reported probably were underpowered, um, certainly for the uh, illicit substance use outcomes but also even in the context of cannabis, tobacco and schizophrenia, some of the um, Mendelian randomization methods that, that rely on the, the least or the weakest assumptions regarding pleiotropy like MR EGA are the least powerful and tend to generate consistent point estimates, but much wider confidence intervals and much larger p-values. So um, instrument strength and, and power is an issue, um, which is only partly offset by large sample size. Okay. Um, and then Yuri Milaneshi asks a question, is there a rule of thumb 
to decide whether certain GWAS results could be used to extract an instrument for two sample um, MR, number of SNPs, R squared of instrument on exposure, or GWAS sample size, for instance. So um, not really rules of thumb. I mean, there are rules of thumb around the, um, the F statistic, which gives you a measure of instrument strength. Um, but uh, generally speaking, if you have variants are identified with genome-wide significance, then you, you have something to begin with in the context of Mendelian randomization. It just depends very much on not only um, the power in your exposure GWAS, but also your outcome GWAS. And one of the things that's becoming um, harder and harder to um, deal with is the degree of sample overlap. Because obviously, as consortia become ever larger, all of the available cohorts start being mopped up by all of the um, different consortia and so the degree of sample overlap is increasing um, which creates a potential overfitting problem if you're generating your exposure and your outcome in essentially the same data. Um, so these are all um, relatively um, open questions to some extent and there's a lot of methodological work going on around this to try and develop new uh, MR methods and um, clear guidelines for when one can and can't adopt this kind of approach. There's a good article, I think just out in the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, that's a, a sort of primer for Mendelian randomization analyses um, by, by George and a few colleagues here in Bristol. Um, uh, that might be a good starting point. Okay, um, and then a colleague from Denmark, Espen Ajerbo, asks, what about selection bias in GWAS samples? Could summary stats be biased? Uh, yes, is the short answer, and that's a particular concern in these very large samples like UK Biobank. Um, it's probably less of a concern in, in case control studies where people have been identified on the basis of, of case status, but um, certainly in population-based studies um, where people essentially volunteer to take part, I think it's a huge problem. So we actually wrote a paper on this um, with the, the, uh, the, uh, the title's a terrible pun, it's Kaleidoscope, um, and it's in the International Journal of Epidemiology. Um, illustrating how you can generate spurious results by conditioning on highly selected samples. UK Biobank, for example, um, enjoyed a, um, a recruitment rate of only 5%. So only 5% of those who were approached actually agreed to take part. So what you end up with is a highly selected sample. And if you have two factors that influence participation in, those, um, uh, in that sample, then those factors will become correlated spuriously via conditioning on a collider. Um, and that's a problem for, um, for GWAS, it's a problem for Mendelian randomization. And again, there's methodological work going on to try and understand how we can um, correct for that, simulate the likely impact of that, and so on. Okay, I was just gonna ask one further question. So there's a paper that I can't completely recall, but it was on bioarchives recently about the ubiquitous nature of pleiotropy and how much you think these methods are able to sufficiently account for those kind of the vertical pleiotropy rather yeah. than the pleiotropy. Yeah, so it's it's the vertical, the, the, the biological pleiotropy that's the um, that's the concern. And um, I think um, to some extent empirically, we can see that they seem to handle it re reasonably well because when you do uh, bidirectional MR using genome-wide significant variants for um, one phenotype like smoking and genome-wide significant variants for another phenotype like uh, schizophrenia, which may partially overlap, but certainly don't overlap fully, um, we see a pathway in one direction compared to another direction. So these are directional analyses. They're not just um, genetic correlations. And it's because you're taking the, the extremes, if you like, of the, uh, of the distribution. And the, but having said that, um, the reason why people are developing all of these different pleiotropy robust methods uh, with MR EGA being one of the earlier ones, but there are several others coming through now, including um, some that use whole genome data rather than just the genome-wide significant variants. Um, the reason people are doing that methodological work is exactly because this is a concern. And at some level, uh, you know, most or all genetic variants are likely to be associated with most or all um, phenotypes. So uh, handling that is a critical part of trying to apply these methods. Okay, great. I think we'll end it there before we venture into omnigenic territory. <laughs> it feels like it's drifting that way. <laughs> okay, brilliant.
Can I just thank you again, Marcus, for, for coming to talk to us. We really appreciate it. And, and also what you've done as a critical friend and really valued critical friend about the methodologies within the field. So thanks for today. And we look forward to, to continued collaborations down the line. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, the, the lab talks available. Um, it's been recorded and will be up online hopefully next week. Um, and enjoy your weekends. And thanks again to Marcus Monaco. All the best. Thanks all. Thanks all. I appreciate it. And do get in touch if you have any, uh, any questions. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. Cheerio. Bye.